Good evening, everyone. It is great to have you here. My name is William Roca. I am the Director of Programs here at Village Preservation. We're very excited to have you here for this presentation of DIY Historic Preservation with Dan Campo, who will be in conversation with uh, Village Preservation's Director of Special Projects, Juan Rivero. So before we get started and I hand it over to Juan and Dan, if you are unfamiliar with Village Preservation, we were founded back in 1980 and we work to document, celebrate and preserve the special architectural cultural heritage of Greenwich Village, the East Village and NoHo. We've helped get landmark designation for over 1,250 buildings and we host over 75 free programs like this throughout the year. That's why your support is incredibly important to us. If you can take a moment, scan that QR code on your screen and consider becoming a member of Village Preservation. While you're at our website, if you're just interested in learning a little bit more about the advocacy work that we do, how we support local businesses, the different programs that we have, and we have an enormous number of free resources, including virtual maps where you can even put your own walking tours of our neighborhoods together. So I highly recommend that you go over to villagepreservation.org. Now for some upcoming programs, this Thursday at 6 p.m., we have a virtual program, Rose Schneiderman, A Voice for Women and Workers. And then next, next week on Wednesday, October 30th, an in-person plaque unveiling for Frances Perkins. If you're interested in attending any of these programs, and we also just recently released our November programs, please head over to the website, villagepreservation.org slash events. With that, I will hand it over to Juan and I am going to disappear in the shadows. Good evening, I'm Juan Rivero, Special Projects Director at Village Preservation. Welcome to our talk on the 2024 presidential election. Sorry, sorry, my bad. I got mixed up here for a second. Uh, this is gonna be even better. We're gonna be talking with Dan Campo about his book on post-industrial DIY preservation. So let me first introduce Dan. Dan is an urbanist and an associate professor at the Department of Design and Planning in the School of Architecture and Planning at Morgan State University in Baltimore. He serves as the director of Morgan's graduate program in city and regional planning. And he's the author of Accidental Playground, Brooklyn Waterfront Narratives of the Undesigned and Unplanned and of Post-Industrial DIY, Recovering American Rust Belt Icons. And most importantly than that, for my purposes, He's a friend. Dan and I have been on the same panel in multiple conferences over the years uh, because we share a similar set of concerns that revolve around the inability of conventional um, historic preservation practice to account for places that inspire widespread appreciation for reasons that are unrelated to architectural integrity or to tightly bound narratives of cultural significance. Uh, these reasons sometimes stem from a collective engagement with the place and with um, how that engagement is informed by the place's symbolic value and materiality. So Dan was uh, studying this limitation of conventional historic uh, preservation practice by looking at a series of post-industrial spaces, abandoned or semi-abandoned, that had been drawing little interest either for their development potential or for their landmark worthiness, but that were nonetheless attracting a variety of small scale grassroots uses that had had the effect of stabilizing some aspect of these places, of generating a public interest in their preservation and of helping pave the way for some form of redevelopment, however fragile or disputed. Dan refers to this process as DIY preservation. And he studied examples of these practices for over 10 years and 
documented his findings in this wonderful book that I got electronically. Dad, could you hold it up? There you go. Uh, it is part industrial history. It is part travelogue, but it is primarily the story of how a series of post-industrial sites have pulled in a variety of actors into a negotiation about the future of these places. And it is also a story about how financial and political incentives, as well as professional standards and practices, constrain the range of available preservation possibilities. It is also a story about the price we pay for operating within this narrow conception of historic preservation. So I'm glad it's out. It was a pleasure to read, and it's great having you here and having the opportunity to discuss it with you. So um, take it away, and after you conclude, I'll ask you a few questions, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. If anyone has any questions or comments, please feel free to uh, put them in the Q&A function that you see at the bottom of the screen, and we'll make sure to get to them. Thank you, Juan. That's a, a very warm uh, and welcoming uh, introduction. You know my work really well, and I think you've already uh, cut to the chase a bit and, and, and set this up rather nicely. Um, I'm going to share my screen if it allows me to. Let me give this a shot. Uh, share. Okay. And uh, let's see if we can make this all connect. Um, let me go to... Uh, so one more thing let me see if i can get it to presenter mode let's see so how does that look does that look like the full full screen or or do you see presenter mode it does okay great fantastic um right so I, i've been looking at what I often call the undesigned and the unplanned, the stuff that uh, city planning and architecture and historic preservation passes over. And I've been looking at these places for uh, like 25 years. And uh, this is my second book of, of this series. I don't know that there'll be a third, but um, it's, it's ripe for discussion even in places like New York. Um, Juan mentioned the accidental playground. There's, there's something really special about places that you can touch, that you can alter, that you can enjoy in a kind of elemental way. This is not a, a rarefied building. This is the site in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Waterfront, maybe some of you are familiar with it, uh, doesn't even have any buildings, but it, it was historic and people engaged in this, with this historic place. And people did a surprise, a variety of people did a a wide variety of things in this place. And um, when I first started looking at this place, you know, two and a half decades ago, um, I didn't even know how to describe it, but I said, this is a place where you can make your own environment. It's a place where you can come into contact with the elemental aspects of nature in the city and um, a, a place of contradiction place that was also changing and a place that would soon change and all of the stuff that I'm showing you now uh, would would go away more or less. Of course, the, the North Brooklyn waterfront was full of these spaces and there were some historic spaces that historic sites that had historic buildings on them like the Domino Sugar Refinery. Domino, the, the complex operated until 2004, and um, it also has a kind of transgressive history that, that happened even before it closed. But I think ma many people know it um, in the context that I'll, in the context of my work anyway, um, as the site of uh, Kara Walker's uh, fantastic uh, uh, installation, uh, The Marvelous Sugar Baby, that was staged in 2014 by the art organization Creative Time. Uh, this was just before this particular building, which is the raw sugar warehouse, was going to be demolished. And so people went into this space and they were wowed by this space. And some people said, hey, you know, maybe this space should continue on. Maybe we can do other programs like this Kara Walker exhibit. 
of course, this, the uh, big bad city was hungry and uh, that building along with uh, some 19 others that made up that former uh, refinery were cleared and only the, the facade of the 1884 core structure of the refinery uh, was left in place. That's now been stabilized. There's a building inside of it uh, and there are more towers. So this we're kind of trading this post-industrial waterfront for a version of, oh, Dubai on the East River or Shanghai on the East River. I spent a lot of time in the 2000s going uh, back and forth between Philadelphia and New York. I was living in Philadelphia that decade. And uh, eventually I would also start going to Baltimore. Philadelphia had its share of uh, abandoned buildings uh, and abandoned industrial buildings. And um, many of them had their own kind of transgressive, do-it-yourself appropriated history. It also had its own a version of the accidental uh, playground, the Reading Railroad or Pier, now known as the Graffiti Pier, which shockingly lasted until this year uh, when part of the pier fell into the water. Um, a place for uh, transgression, a place for engagement with historic industrial structures, a place to kind of make your own environment. Also a place with a, a kind of uh, interesting, previously dicey uh, social uh, milieu as well. Um, so these places have their good and their bad, and, and that will mean different things for different people. Other structures in Philadelphia didn't last as long. This was the, um, this was the uh, cramped sh shipyard machine shop, um, part of a, a, what was once a sprawling, very large uh, shipyard um, site. And uh, this was demolished in 2007 to make a new exit for I-95 to serve the Sugar House Casino, the Sugar House Casino being on the grounds of the former Revere Sugar Finery, which was a victim of a previous wave of industrial demolition. Uh, there were other buildings that also came down during that period of the 2000s of the Schmitz Brewery, some 20 buildings, including a, a, a lovely 1894 Victorian administration building completely cleared. Um, the Philco radio and television plant, several buildings were taken down in that place, including probably the city's first daylight factory. And then there were others. And then this building here, and this was kind of the, the turning point, the nadir for me anyway, personally, uh, was the uh, demolition of the Gilbert Arts Building. The Gilbert Building was a building, a, a, just an office building. It was rather elegant. You can see it here um, in the moments before, as it's being demolished, actually. Um, it was on the National Register um, and put there in 1984. And in the 90s, uh, arts organizations made a deal with the owner of the building and began to move in and to do um, do-it-yourself renovations and uh, staging arts programs there. And the the building, by by the beginning of the 21st century, the building had quite a buzz and people every once a month, their, their open studios were drawing people up and down the East Coast. Uh, there was sympathetic development going on around the building and uh, uh, small modest restorations and ad adaptations of office space and what was um, a, a turn of the century office district. Uh, but this particular building was in the path of the Pennsylvania Convention Center and uh, the, the Philadelphia Boosters wanted to bring that very, very, very large building, uh, one more giant Philadelphia block uh, across one more block uh, to meet uh, North Broad Street. And that happened. And you see that here in this uh, building here on the left, that's the existing older part of the 90s part of the convention center and all uh, some 15 buildings and all were taken down to extend that convention center to the West, including the Odd Fellows Hall here from 1894 also on the uh, National Register. So this was done in the name of economic development, but the, the, area, the area was already being stimulated. It didn't need it and, and convention centers are hugely wasteful. Um, 
Anyway, what was going on in New York and in Philadelphia um, uh, kind of shook me. And I, I, I thought, you know, I, where, where can we continue this experiment and grassroots engagement with historic places? Where, where can I find it? So I went out to Detroit and, you know, I learned a lot in Detroit and some of it wound up in the book and some of it didn't. One of the places I was taken to within, within an hour of arriving in Detroit is the Michigan Central Station. This was 2003, my first visit. And, um, I mean, it's an unbelievable structure now being, um, now recently restored and reopened by the, of all people, the Ford Motor Company. The interior of the, Michigan Central Station. Michigan Central Station was designed by uh, Warren and Wetmore and Stem and Reed, the same team that designed uh, Grand Central Station in New York, the other, you know, also for the same New York Central um, company. And um, this building was abandoned in 1988 and uh, all kinds of transgressive uses happened inside this, this building. And this space in particular, the waiting room, uh, modeled after the Baths of Caracalla, was the site of um, the Eminem video from 2009. Uh, beautiful, if you if you know that that video, much of it was shot inside of this particular building. I like to say this was probably the most famous abandoned indoor space in the United States, uh, but now it's been um, claimed by Ford, and uh, you know, not there's a connection actually. Be, between the informal and the formal, the appropriated, and what's actually going on there now. Ford was interested in that history. You can't go and look at abandoned industrial spaces in Detroit without going to the Packard plant. The Packard plant was the largest automobile plant in the world when it was finished in the early part of the first decade of the 20th century. It's the first plant made primarily of reinforced concrete. Uh, it was a prototype for nearly all auto production buildings through the 1920s, including uh, the designer was uh, Al, the great Detroit architect, Albert Kahn, including Kahn's famous uh, Highland Park plant and the River Rouge plant in Dearborn, uh, built for Ford. And a kind of the buildings of Packard uh, were kind of a prototype for just about all factory architecture in the US. Um, in the 90s and early 2000s, it was the site of um, uh, techno dance parties and art experiments. That building now, is, it's been the bane of the existence of the mayor of Detroit and previous mayors, and it's now being progressively taken down as I am moving these slides. I get really interested in seeing uh, automobile factories in, in Metro Detroit and Southeast Michigan. And um, I wrote a paper on it or co-wrote a paper on it. Um, the, the punchline is basically any historic plant uh, in Southeast Michigan uh, was either subsumed by a brand new plant or uh, demolished and cleared, including uh, Buick City and Flint and uh, Jefferson North Assembly Plant, uh, the site of four earlier historic plants, uh, which uh, that, that particular plant is actually still operative. But many of these places are, are just abandoned open spaces now when um, the, the particular buildings look, maybe look something like the Packard building and could have been reused and adapted. Eventually I got over to Buffalo too, and Buffalo had its train station, but people were doing something about it. Uh, there was a grassroots preservation effort uh, around the station and a particular city council member got involved and uh, they publicly shamed the owner into uh, giving up title, find him. Uh, the city took it and conveyed it to a not-for-profit develop uh, preservation corporation. Uh, this is in 1998. And uh, that particular preservation uh, project had no money, no expertise, no nothing, but they they opened up, they cleaned up the building, they opened it up to uh, volunteers, they had events there. And now that building has gotten about um, $100 million and 25 years later, $100 million or so in, in uh, funding. 
and in state and federal and local funding, and uh, it's going to be a mixed use development and so on. So um, I, I try to look at things through a, a long sweep of time. You can't go to Buffalo without and, and be interested in historic preservation uh, without going to the grain elevators. Uh, many of them there are still standing and they're still abandoned. These are the the structures that Rainer Banham and before him the the great European modernists, people like Mendelssohn and Corbusier and Walter Gropius, uh, found inspiration and um, served as inspiration for uh, architectural modernism, cultural modernism, uh, brutalism eventually, and so on. Um, uh, this experience of going to these sites and seeing them is is a kind of unbelievable experience. Their their scale, their monumentality, their beauty, uh, and uh, many people uh, do it even in this kind of state. I thought it was important to see preservation success stories, so I uh, went spent some time going across the Rust Belt looking at. Uh, places that we could say, well, hey, this is where uh, historic preservation practice came in and uh, preserved uh, fantastic buildings, uh, like Lewis Sullivan's Guarantee Buildings on the left and H.H. Richardson's Buffalo State Hospital, now called the Richardson on the right on the grounds designed by uh, Olmsted and Vox. Um, what these buildings have in common they're, they're complicated case studies, particularly the hospital, but, uh, you know, tens of millions of public dollars went into these buildings eventually. And um, in the case of the hospital, uh, probably over a hundred million dollars in public funding, uh, but yet there's still parts of the complex that are abandoned, right? To, we, we are under this kind of belief that it takes tons of money to engage historic landscapes and, and my research says otherwise also you've got to go to darwin martin house if you're in buffalo one of frank lloyd wright's uh, greatest uh, prairie homes and uh, this is this also like the the, the richardson and like uh, the central terminal was a ruin in the 1990s but about $50 million was raised and uh, 25 million of that was um, in public funds. And uh, eventually the, the building was renovated and included, included a, a $10 million visitor center designed by Toshiko Mori where that picture is being taken from, right? Again, uh, just, just for a single family home, we, we spent uh, 25, over $25 million in public money and uh, another 25 million in, in uh, foundation and, and, and uh, donations. Um, what do we do for that train station? What do we do for the grain elevators if, if, if this is what it costs to do a, a single family home? Places, we can find success stories all over though. They, they dot the map, but again, places like Mass Mocha, very, very expensive. And, and not, not every place can marshal these art world powerhouses to spend the tens of, mil tens of millions of dollars, uh, raise that money to uh, do something like Mass Mocha. Fantastic place, but not, not every abandoned space can be a Mass Mocha. Of course, if you're gonna talk about uh, preservation in industrial sites, you, you've gotta go to Emshire Park and see um, see the constellation of different industrial and, and natural sites that, that make up Emshire Park, including Duisburg Nord, um, a former steel plant that is now, um, the, it's the kind of uh, gold standard of industrial preservation. It's just this beautiful cultural park with all this program of all its activities. Um, but, you know, we in the United States don't fund these projects like they do in the EU or in particular in Germany. And we also don't have the same kind of, I, I would argue, a, a playful approach about what we do with them, right? We, 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 we believe in, in the, the Frank Lloyd Wright house uh, where we've got to kind of preserve things in, as they were um, when Wright first designed them. Um, and and that, that approach doesn't work for... Uh, big industrial sites, and I would argue uh, also many civic and office complexes as well. So, you know, this is where I kind of formulated 
the questions that that guide uh, the book you know that we we either places either meet this very that that Juan talked about at the beginning this very very high standard of historic preservation both in terms of their architectural integrity and also in terms of their market readiness to uh, be adapted for mostly high-end uses like hotels or uh, tech complexes or condominiums. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not against using historic structures in, in these ways. And in fact, I've enjoyed going to see these structures or being in these structures, but, but we don't do it for everything and we can't do it for everything. And it's not appropriate to do it for, for everything. And when we don't have that kind of integrity and we don't have that kind of funding we say hey they're they're hazards we've, we've got to clear them we've got to make room for the future and in fact um just as buffalo had kind of turned the corner for preservation of industrial structures is making a name for itself and rust belt preservation across the world um archer daniels midland demolished uh, the great northern uh, grain elevator there on the left on the left on the right side of the left um, the largest grain elevator in the world in, uh, in 1897 when it was built. And uh, the last, I, I think it's the actual last steel binned uh, grain elevator in North America. And, and now it's gone, right? Even though there was a counter movement to raise money to do a real um, preservation of the building and adapt it for a whole bunch of different uses. So, you know, we, we're not comfortable with... Um, with old buildings, uh, we, we, we're not comfortable with it unless we, we know we can put in a high-end use a la Domino, right? So we've got this structure here on the left, uh, but all the rest of the stuff is gone. It didn't, it didn't make the cut. So this is where this book kind of comes in. And, and you know, I, I'm trying to figure out what, 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 what do we do with this? How can we engage structures that are, are meaningful to people uh, but don't meet this market or integrity test. And then if we're going to engage those buildings, how do we engage them in a way that when we're all done with whatever we're going to do with them, that they retain some kind of elemental post-industrial qualities that drove people there to their, in the first place. And then if, if we're successful there, um, can we build around this? Can, does this change urbanism around um around these places so they don't just become another kind of uh, gentrified neighborhood on the way up. Can we build a post-industrial DIY? So I, I've kind of shown you those sites that I, I looked at. I looked at like, I started with like probably, it was, my list was very fluid, maybe 15, 18 sites, eventually narrow them down to five sites. Silo City, which you're gonna to see today with the grain elevators, uh, Central Terminal, which I've already talked about just a little bit. Uh, Kerry Blast Hormones, I'll talk just a spec about that. Uh, Packard Plant, great chapter. I, I like to think it's a, it's a really good chapter in my book. Uh, difficult to write, but it's there. And uh, Michigan Central Station, uh, which I've talked a little bit about. Let's look at Silo City. It's a, it's a kind of a post-industrial success story. And it, it's, all of these stories are actually still unfolding. This is what the historic American engineering uh, record found in 1990 when they went to survey these buildings. Um, some were active, some were not active, um, but it was an incredible uh, landscape as it was declining. But note there was no green in, anywhere on these sites. The, the four grain elevators that are gonna be Silo City, um, there's one and uh, the other three are behind here, but it's in this, this place that uh, called Elevator Alley, what um, Rainer Banham called the concrete Atlantis. Um, and it, they kind of bracket or the Silo City is in a little like oxbow uh, in the Buffalo River. And the, the Buffalo River was a former industrial cesspool that caught on fire in 1968. It's been the subject of a, a decades long EPA supervised cleanup. But yet, uh, this, this photo is from 2009, um, you know, people were attracted to this little patch of nature, this little uh, river and fished in it and hung out in it amid these globally consequential structures. 
one of the people who was really interested in it in this structure um was i'm going to use a laser pointer here was this guy here uh, Rick Smith, who owned uh, Rigidized Metal, he was a third generation owner of Rigidized Metal, which is directly south of these four grain elevators that he that he's going to buy in 2006. And um, he wanted the grain elevators, he wanted just a bit of them, he, ConAgra had bought up all these grain elevators from four different previous entities, they were built on separate plots by, by different companies. So ConAgra owned them in the early 2000s, and um, he, he just wanted an easement, a piece of property to facilitate movement inside his, uh, to his metal uh, fabrication plant. Um, and the ConAgra representative said, I'm going to sell you that little bit of land that you want, and I'm going to throw in the four elevators, and I'm going to do it all for $160,000. So he bought all four of these elevators, one, two, three, four, for $160,000. Of course, it was a big responsibility and, and they were all not, they, none of them were operative at that moment and uh, they weren't in great shape. Um, his idea, his idea was to, uh, his original idea was I'm gonna, we're going to create an ethanol plant and um, we're going to use the grain elevators to store the grain that will go into the, the plant. And uh, ethanol was on the rise in the early 2000s and people had all the gas stations had to mix their gasoline with 10% ethanol. It seemed like a great bet. And uh, preservationists were behind it, including these university at Buffalo professors here that you see him with because he was going to reuse these structures. They weren't going to get just demolished. And he was going to reuse them in a way that was consistent with the uses that they were built. How, how rare is that? Um, they were preparing uh, National Register nominations around that time. Uh, but uh, Rick Smith ran into uh, some issues because he needed a bunch of permits and people didn't want to live near these ethanol plants. So there was contestation, there was lawsuits. Uh, eventually he, he outlasted them and he got all the permits in a row, but the recession, the great recession happened and the price of ethanol tanked and he was, it, it was no longer made sense to do this in Buffalo. Uh, so he was back to, to square one. And, and that's kind of when I meet, met him in 2012 and I had lunch with him and, and he said, you know, Dan, um, I, the, the ethanol, I, I never really wanted to do the ethanol anyway. I, I just thought that that made the most sense. I, uh, it seemed like highest and best use, uh, but it didn't really work out. I, I want to do something fun. I, I want to engage this place. I want to bring Buffalo back to the river, back, bring all these productive activities back to the river. So he started Silo City. And when he started Silo City, he did, the name wasn't even permanent. It was just something that he was calling it. Um, and, and some of the the historic preservationists were not so happy with that name. They thought it was obscuring the, the uses of the, the, the individual silos. Anyway, it was an experiment and it was an unfolding experiment. Like, how, you know, and you can see the appeal. If you can allow people on there, um, it's, it's an unbelievable, it's, it's the experience that Rainer Bannum had in the late seventies when he was in uh, Buffalo. And, this, this place was uns, unsecured, unimproved, unmediated. It was open and ruinous, but it was fantastic. Mon, a monumental industrial landscape like few others. Um, Rick didn't really have a plan. He thought, if I could do like three projects a year, we can make this thing go and I'll see what happens down the road. So so no, no he... The historic preservation documentation was still happening during that time, but but no master plan, no major fundraising. Uh, he's going to engage the landscape and allow others to engage it, and and he entered into a, a bunch of partnerships to do tiny little things like um, this boat dock, uh, often with school kids helping out, and money from the U.S. and Fish and Wildlife um, uh, Service, also festivals, right. Things that were projects that were three and four figures rather than eight and nine figures. 
one of the things about Buffalo, it's a, it's a small, it's, it's a relatively small city now. It's lost, uh, even with its little mini revival that it's on, still half the size it was in 1950. Uh, but it punches above its weight in uh, creative activity, music, art, theater, all of those things are alive and well in Buffalo. And it's, it's kind of a, a little bit of a training ground, an incubator for New York City. It was it was in the 70s and 80s when the pictures generation people were at University at Buffalo, and it still is now. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the grain elevators, like let's, uh, Rick Smith and his uh, caretaker, uh, Swanee Jim Watkins said, you know, let's open these things up to the people of Buffalo and see what they propose. And then if they can figure out how to do it, we'll allow them to do it. So they did Rick Smith didn't have all the ideas, but he allowed others to come in and, and program the space, including uh, the Silo City Reading Series, um, which became very quickly became um, a, a kind of a big deal, right? It, it was a local, an incubator for local talent at the same time, uh, touring poets and literary figures like Ocean Wong and Dennis Smith and Jericho Brown. Jericho Brown just won a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant this year, uh, like last couple of weeks even. Um, they all read in, inside the silos of the Marine A uh, green terminal, the same terminal that um, you know Rainer Banham was so enamored with in the late 70s. Um, Lots of different art installations and exhibits, including uh, Valerie Lyman's Breaking Ground about um, the uh, the Bakken region in North in North Dakota. You know, kind of like superimposing a boom and bust cycle against a previous boom and bust cycle. Um, lots of theater. Two different theater companies staged their site specific events, including the Torn Space Theater Company, which every year stages a public ritual. Uh, an original work that they uh, write and draft people from the audience often into uh, being part of their production uh, in different parts of the campus, including uh, 2015, They Kill Things. Here's from uh, 2022 when they did Ages outside of the, the grain elevators. Uh, this particular uh, spot, which is known as the Meadow, would have been in 1990 when the historic American engineering people came to, to document it. This would have been all railroad tracks. It was the whole entire complex was hardscape and um, uh, railroad tracks, very little green. And uh, much of the green, including this cottonwood tree, um, kind of self-seeded and evolved on its own right. Um, it, it, it created this wonderfully sublime space, but also inspired others. It was a place of possibility. And all of this kind of bottom up grassroots activity that Rick Smith is allowing on the site is also complementing all of the, you know, the cleanup, the, the, the formal and informal is, is in dialogue here with the EPA cleanup of the Buffalo River. Uh, when, in 2009, in May, when I took that picture, uh, you know, there was a couple of, you know, it's 80 degrees out and there's uh, like three boats that go by the river in, in you know, 45 minutes. And by a, a decade later, like any, at any time, there's like hundreds of boats out on the river. It, it's an unbelievable that, that all of these different elements are coming together to make something more than just a historic site. And uh, Rick was like uh, left, you know, he, he, he opened up the site to dreamers and, and, and uh, Rick is certainly a dreamer too, but he was also uh, pretty realistic and he knew all the DIY stuff couldn't keep the building standing and they would need new roofs and programming and permanent uses. And uh, that day would come. Uh, and he also wanted to, he always was interested in uh, having a little like bar and, and performance space and grill. And uh, it took him several years or a whole bunch of stumbling blocks. Eventually he was able to open a Duende and then the, behind it, the Watu Cantina. And uh, from the moment it opened in 2018, where they're having this World Cup watch party um, to the present day, there's like, there's unbelievable amount of programming in it, like 
five days a week, there's concerts outside or inside. There's art shows, there's theater. I did a, I did a post-industrial DIY reading there in, uh, in August. Um, it, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a very spirited place. And um, it, it, again, it, even as, the, the grain elevators themselves are going to become the, the outbuildings around the grain elevators are going to become uh, apartments. Um, Rick carved out a space that would uh, retain some of the and uh, incubate some of the DIY activities that had preceded it. Landscape experiments, all, all done without any of the you know noted landscape architecture firms is all done by hand by people interested in doing things stocking and building this pond and with with fish stocked with fish and of course a birds of prey are coming and eating the the fish and they have to keep restocking it uh landscape experiments dot the site today and there's the if you can see here the this is the mill building for um, the American Grain Elevator, which is right here. This is Duende and the Watu. Um, this is going to become apartments and some community and some office space. And then there's two, there's four grain elevators in the complex. Three of them, the outbuildings, will become apartments. The fir this first piece is 100% affordable to 80% of um, AMI from 20 to 80% of A AMI in, in Baltimore, uh, excuse me, in the Buffalo metropolitan area. Um, so the site is changing, it's maturing, it's evolving. And some of the, the more edgy stuff is gonna go away, um, but some of it's gonna stay and uh, places kind can't stay as they are in this kind of transgressive way forever. And, I would argue that whatever um, Silo City becomes, it's it's a it's a pretty good outcome. Looking at the possibilities and all the demolition that goes on all over the place, and uh, Rick is committed to he's he's a he's a cowboy. He, he's he's got all these ideas about um, refugees from Africa and from Asia. Um, being part of the revitalization of Buffalo, and he built this uh, soccer field, this youth soccer field. Um, for refugees to play so their kids can play soccer. He, he's hired these guys from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo to work in, in Duende. Um, so he's found ways to continue to do that, to, to, to channel the, uh, the DIY at Silo City. Um, we'll just take a quick br a breeze through, Silo, uh, through another place that's, that's the same but very different than Silo City. Uh, to give you a sense that each of these are chapters in the book, um, the carry blast furnaces in uh, Pittsburgh. And there couldn't have been a more famous uh, a steel plant in all the United States. This was U.S. Steel's flagship uh, plant uh, through the first five decades of the 20th century. This is the most famous, I'll say the most famous steel plant in the world during that time. And um, this is where on the right side of the Mon, the right bank of the Mon River, where they made the iron, they put the iron, they poured it into uh, special uh, cars, railroad cars in, in a molten state. And then those, molten, those rail cars were taken over to the other side of the river where they were made into steel. Um, that steel became the Chrysler building, became railroads became um, became the steel that went into shipbuilding that built ships for um, World War I, World War II, um, wars previous to that. Um, all of the plate steel from the, uh, for the US uh, space program was built there through the 1970s. Uh, you know, so carry, US steel, carry, that's synonymous with Pittsburgh, and I would argue synonymous with the American way of life, right? Anyway, this site here on the left side became the waterfront, a kind of giant shopping center. Um, not that I'm totally against shopping centers, a very generic kind of could be anywhere. Uh, there were some bits of the complex that were left in place 
but they were kind of token gestures like the um, smokestacks that you see in the upper right. Um, the other side of the river, the place where they made the iron, um, this site was bought by a, a company called the Parks Corporation, both sites. And they, what they do is they deconstruct in, industrial sites after they're closed and then they sell, they retool the machinery and sell it to, to like, you know, steel plants in India and Brazil. And that's what happened to um, Homestead Steel on the, the left side there. Um, those stuff, that, those materials, the presses and some of the other pieces all went to uh, India and Brazil. Um, the, the waterfront was built on the left side, on the steel side, because they had better road access, it was bigger, and that material was worth more to um, foreign uh, builders. The right side where they made the iron was harder to get to and harder to get the scrap out of. So they started demolishing it. But again, the recession uh, came and uh, they never finished it. It got delayed for lots of different reasons. And meanwhile, uh, it, it kind of became this transgressive jungle. Very, very difficult to get to without an automobile. It wasn't like sites in New York that urban explorers would get to. You'd have to kind of drive and park in a neighborhood, hike down into a hill to get into the site. Anyway, as the Parks Corporation is looking to demolish the site, figuring out where to get the money from, where to sell the scrap, and uh, there's a movement in industrial preservation history an industrial heritage movement is trying to save these buildings. At the same time, um, local youth are wandering this site. They have time on their hands. It's the Rust Belt, right? A, a, a local youth said to me, well, I was on an official, I've been on this, this tight site tour four times. And on one of them, there was a person who said, yeah, I, I used to come here all the time with my friends. She said, it was a, it's a birthright the uh, for youth of Southwest Pennsylvania, it's a birthright to wander through industrial ruins. Anyway, the one of some of those wanderers included uh, artists from uh, Pittsburgh Industrial Arts Co-op. They formed this group called the Industrial Arts Co-op, uh, seven artists in all, and uh, they were doing stuff uh, on a steel plant that's south of downtown that was made famous by Flashdance. Have you seen that movie from the early 1980s? That, that's all gone now. Uh, and then they, they went to other sites. Eventually they wound up here at Cary. Here's two of the, the artists um, that did this incredible structure. First, they built the owl. Um, they were interested in the kind of dialectic between uh, rust and nature, nature and culture, um, past and present. And uh, they found all this cool stuff in the uh, on site, including hay. They had all this hay and they found these big giant industrial plastic bags and they built this, um, the owl, the carry owl from one here. This is about, I'd say this is about 30 feet from one end to the other. Um, it was a kind of cool, you know, all found objects kind of art. And um, again, they didn't have a, a kind of idea that it would be a permanent installation. And it wasn't because uh, some other people were exploring Cary and uh, someone with binoculars who had seen them uh, from his house on the hillside and called the police. The police showed up, chased these three kids, shot one of, to one of them, two, leg, two bullets in the leg. He survived, he was okay, but they arrested all three youth made the it made the new local news and um the uh the parks corporation found out uh, they had known about about this and they the local news said it was a voodoo was happening on the on the site there was a, a famous broadcast where they said voodoo is and this this owl was part of it anyway they they made access harder they they put um, they, they took out staircases, they did kind of typical things, added more patrols that for industri big, indi you know, unruly industrial sites that you do to survive. Eventually the carry, the carry deer artists leave the site, go to West Virginia for a while. Eventually they come back to build the carry deer, which is here. Uh, the carry deer, 
again, built thinking about this dialectic between rust and nature, past and present. Uh, this is about 40 feet from the base of the deer's neck to the top, the very top of the antler, um, all made of metal found on site, uh, plastic hoses found on site, all built with hand tools. It took um, 50 weekends uh, to build it, 50 Sundays, uh, and um, they didn't know that it, they could get it into, that, they, that it would stay in place. They had to hoist it on, onto, into place. It had to be big, otherwise it couldn't have a dialogue with the large machinery around it. Um, and it was done when they finished it, and this is 1998. Um, one of the artists said, I, I relinquished ownership of the deer the moment it was done. You know, like we built it, it was great, but, you know, invited our friends to see it, but, but that was it. Well, somehow the deer persisted and uh, other people found out about it, including this guy, Ron Baroff, who was leading the, um, who was the Rivers of Steel uh, director of archives at Rivers of Steel is the National Heritage Area that was formed in the mid 2000s to preserve different sites. And he kept the owners of the site in part to um, from demolishing it. I, I won't go in through the, the that long story. Um, this is an old steel worker giving who gives tours now. Um, but he, he, he and, got and, the, yeah. and let me let me jump in uh, just to help folks to uh, to put in questions in the Q&A uh, uh, function that you see at the bottom of Zoom. Uh, we'll try to get to those very uh, shortly. Yeah, I just got a couple of minutes left. So much like, uh, you know, remember that carry because it's the underlying land is owned by Allegheny County and it's being programmed by the National Park Service is not like Silo City. Rick Smith ran that place like a cowboy and he, he was, you know, he wasn't afraid of taking chances. This is very, they're very risk averse here. And, and um, they, they're, they're much more concerned about safety and, you know, there's much more rules, but yet they, they've done a lot, right. Uh, with very little money, right. The minimal sweat equity, volunteer driven landscape design, trial and error programming, American Ninja Warrior, right? Again, much like in like Silo City, there's you know the opportunity for local arts and culture and programming. American Ninja Warrior in 2015, the Bach Choir performing Smoke and Steel, an original piece performed built written just for uh, the Cary Furnaces, the Festival of Combustion, where um, metal artists. Uh, build a little mini blast furnace. There's the actual blast furnace, and here's the the mini blast furnace that they build. Where the, and then they pour the molten steel into these art molds, right? So the the history of steel continues to move forward. It, it continues to uh, have have an audience, to have participants. Um, metal making is alive and well. It's taken different forms now. It's not as important as it once be. This this site speaks to uh, what Pittsburgh is today as much as it speaks to its past, the, that moment where they pour the molten steel into the blocks of ice. And you can see that uh, Allegheny County, the underlying owner of this site, um, this is like 60 acres or so. This core piece is 29 acres. Um, they didn't like any of this. They wanted it all gone. They were saying, we have to make make uh, warehouses and employ people. We need employment, right? Uh, this was the site of the failed Amazon bid, the, the Pittsburgh region's failed Amazon bid. But Rivers of Steel the said, we make that site more, we make those other sites more valuable. And in fact, Allegheny County now is able to market these sites in part because the blast furnaces are right here. Uh, it makes this whole place more valuable and, and they're going to have the the tech flex space, they're gonna have a, a film production center that's all being built right now around that. So just uh, two, two more slides. Um, you know, there's a kind of, these places unfold in time and uh, some succeed and some don't. They're, they're not gonna stay in their raw transgressive, transgressive states forever. And the question is, is like, what do they become? 
And how should we feel about them professionally? Well, I would argue that if you can, you know, here you've got the Packard plant, uh, the ultimate transgressive site, and then you have the Michigan Central Station, this photo taken around this time last year, um, a billion dollar plan for the the train station and the surrounding area. It's a, it's a big, big deal kind of a thing. Um, but if you can engage places in its early state, when it's, when it's raw, and you engage them and you grow them and you open them up and you create access, you change what it becomes in the end. That, that engaging them in the beginning, you don't necessarily get the, the neoliberal worst case scenario in the end, and you may not get demolition either. Not everything is going to succeed. So, so there's, there's an arc of formality, but and every one of these stages is vital and worth talking about. But um, but engaging them in the early stage gets you something different. You get Silo City, you get the Carry Blast versus you don't get uh, clearance and uh, rebuild. So wh what are the lessons here? And we can bring this back to New York, right? Um, well, it, I won't talk about all of them, but first is that historic preservation practice is so focused on economic development. So it's all about the future, right? It's all about the future. If we can just preserve these places, we're taking the past and we're turning it into the future. But when we do this, we miss the present and the present is vital. And we can do so much today. We can do so much tomorrow. We can do stuff next week, next month six months from now, if we can kind of refocus our lens to think about incremental development. Um, anyone who's in a position to act to get involved with a building or a site that's, that they feel is important, it's, it's incumbent upon you to do it. Otherwise, it'll be gone or someone else will claim it. So, you know, don't wait, be the agent of change. Uh, be satisfied with incrementalism. Don't try to make it all perfect from the beginning. Be like Silo City. Be like uh, the carry furnaces. Incremental growth is good. Mistakes are fine. Learn from them, grow from them, redirect. All of these things are important. You're going to have to take some risks. Embrace them. Try to, try to minimize risks as best as you can. Access is very important. If you can bring people to sites, that might change things. And, uh, you know, let's talk about um, what this might mean for New York City and Lower Manhattan, and uh, if we can bring post-industrial DIY back to New York, and I'd love to hear your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. That's that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, do you want to get out of the? Sure, sure. Uh, here, please. Wonderful. Uh, so again, if you have questions, put them in the Q and A. Um, so your cases offer an eloquent demonstration of the value of post-industrial places in terms of a set of activities and experiences that they make possible. And they also help me make an argument for broadening our conception of historic preservation. And I wanna connect those arguments to cases outside of post-industrial spaces in the Rust Belt and specifically those located in stronger markets. Um, you draw this distinction, especially in your book, between strong markets and weak markets and present lack of development interest as a condition for the activity you document. But lack of development interest is not the only condition protecting places from the whims of development capital, right? You have the commodified spaces, you have uh, regulation. So the question is how you make different property arrangements so as to serve the ends that you describe. So let's talk first about the question of value. Um, much of what you and others uh, appreciate in these places stems from their mon monumentality, their expansiveness, their remove and their decay. And I'm wondering how you apply uh, your argument to neighborhoods like ours and to sites that are smaller, more proximate, less deteriorating. Yeah. That's a well, you know, you've, you've hit upon some really difficult issues. And in fact, like the book is a way for me to, you know, attempt to have this begin this conversation. And I, I don't have like a, a nice, neat answer for this. But I think some of these some of these lessons apply across the board. And the more I think about it, um, 
you know, there's no reason why uh, we can't engage uh, a greater variety of structures and smaller places with uh, incremental uses, things that are already happening in places. Um, and some of this is like, I think some of this is breaking the will of the politicians, right? It, again, it's this idea that, you know, this particular building or this site needs to service this need of the city you know in new york right juan you know and everyone knows we've got the city of yes right the, the, all of a sudden you know affordable housing is is like job creation in the midwest it, it's a kind of you, you can't argue for you can't argue against it whatever anyone invokes uh, you get labeled a kind of traitor or a gentrifier or you want to keep people out, right? Um, of course, it goes against the whole idea of comprehensive planning with all of the different pieces that we need to, to make and run a, a city successfully and in a vital uh, urbanistic fashion, right? So I think we have got to kind of school our politicians and say, this is not about you know, knocking down that, you know, adding to that number of affordable units. This is not about like, you know, the, the 41 jobs that you're going to create or 62 jobs. This is about something that that's more in a way more important. And if it's successful, those those kinds of things will come on their own or we'll find other ways to do them. So we, we have to educate our politicians and the people who work in our planning departments and the people who run our economic development agencies from EDC on down um, to say, look, you know, we have to have a greater conception of historic places. And I like to use the word old places, right? Again, a lot of these places that, that I'm interested in, I, I've showed you the most kind of spectacular big sites, but I'm interested in a lot of work a day buildings and sites and old smaller factories. Like some of these places don't, don't meet that muster for, uh, even the, the National Register. Um, but, you know, when people get into them, they they have an experience. They say, wow, this is really cool. Or, wow, this building is amazing. And they, they want to touch that building. And it's not nostalgia. They're not remembering something. They're, they're seeing a building that um, provides, that impresses them, that provides a feeling to them. And, and that feeling is old, it, that feeling is historic, even if they don't know anything about the history of the building. And certainly uh, that's how people approach places in, who, who've experienced these places in a raw state in, um, in, in Buffalo and in Detroit and Pittsburgh and, and even in New York. Um, so, you know, no, I, I, think mean, we, I think we have to like educate our, our leaders about the, that, that historic preservation means a lot more than just economic development. Let me let me push let me um, home in on a couple of the, um, the value dimensions that that you highlight and see if I can uh, push you to point to particular places and to make this a little bit more concrete at least in terms of the question of value. One of the valuable aspects of the places that you describe is that they offer the possibility of recovery, and of you know this possibility of redeeming what has been lost to decay. Uh, offers its own reward. But if you think of that more broadly, it also speaks to the satisfaction of collaboration and of having a say in the shaping of the environment around us, which is where you started with uh, Brooklyn. And I'm wondering whether that quality can be made available in areas that are not as marred by abandonment or decay as the ones that you study. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, in New York is New York is extremely difficult to do these kinds of things right now. It, it is just because every place is already claimed by, by by dozens of stakeholders, and there's there's such a high level of professionalism in urban development. And if you don't believe that's true, believe me, go to other cities, and and you you know you'll you'll yearn for the the dysfunction of New York. Um, and so again, I think there's value in pushing back with our leaders. But you're absolutely right about this idea. 
um, you know, places like um, the Central Terminal train station in uh, Buffalo uh, became a kind of collective project. And it was that for 25 years. Now it's being professionally uh, professionally developed. And they'll keep some stuff about it going on. And, and, and you know, people who go there, you know, next year or five years from now when the first phases are done we'll say i remember when you could do this and the whole place was you know busted up and you know we but we had our cleanup and we had the you know the october fest in here right um i like to say these places are places of possibility and they allow people to get their hands dirty you know uh, doing something collective with other people right at a site that has more than it's more than it's like fixing up your house or your your boat or your van and you, but it's, it's, a, it's on a collective level. So it, it maybe it's akin to um, like a neighborhood cleanup or, um, yeah. you, you know, a, a community garden. Right. So, so the, the question is, is where, where, where can you do this in New York city? And well, you know, we can't do it in East river park anymore. Um, you know, it's going to look different in New York City, and maybe it's less about the constructive arts. Maybe it's more about programming, right? Maybe that site on Wall Street, the, um, that uh, fantastic uh, early 1980s um, atrium that was recently closed, uh, that could have been a, a DIY site, right? There was opposition, a lot of opposition to um to the redevelopment plan of that space. I, I can't remember what the, the building address was or what the building was called. Um, it was a, a, a Kevin Roche space. Um, so, you know, it's, it's up to you guys to figure out where that space is and, um, and to make that claim, um, you know, like I didn't, I didn't come up with the idea of like reclaiming the Brooklyn waterfront for interesting and cool offbeat stuff. Other people did it and I just happened to observe it and record it. Right. So um, I don't have one answer and it's certainly difficult, but you know, New York is, New York is constantly re we're all constantly reinventing ourselves in New York. The city's reinventing itself. Um, there se never seems to be any opportunities in New York, but yet, We've got creative communities all around us. We've got venues for music, venues for art, right? And not everything is like this high-end gallery or, you know, the High Line, or well, High Line's kind of cool, right? Or the Whitney. Um, there's, there's stuff that's percolating up and, and there's, there's a finite amount of material of, of post-industrial space left. So we're gonna have to start thinking about what else we can appropriate and transgress. The example that you give the, of the community gardens, I think it is, um, it's the one that immediately came to mind, you know, like right. the, La Plaza Cultural in particular. So the, the story of that very briefly, you had a group of uh, community activists in uh, Loisaida. They started a cleanup of an abandoned lot that had become a dumping ground. A green guerrilla activist, uh, Liz Christie, seated it and greened it. Artist Gordon, uh, Gordon Meta Clark built a... Uh, um, an auditorium there, and they even build geo geodesic domes as experimental experiments in affordable living. But that space today is democratically owned. Uh, it is garden, playground, farm, uh, composting site, performance venue, and an all-purpose gathering space. Now, if bonuses were given uh, for these kinds of spaces instead of for uh, manicured uh, um, parks or, or, or worse, uh, windswept plazas, uh, uh, maybe you might have something. Let me, let me ask you about- oh, I agree. I agree. <laughs> let me ask you about another uh, quality that jumped out at me. Um, the possibility of exploration and escape. That is something that you describe and that you describe as existing intention with efforts to offer the experience to more people. But one of the things that struck me was that that experience of escape and the possibility of exploration is more than just about physical distance. It also can relate to uh, temporal distances, though, to evocations uh, of the past. It can relate to contrast from everyday life, even if it's something as simple as observing the same surroundings from a different perspective. You offer the example of the High Line, and I would argue that for all its uh, 
uh, you know, for, for all the, 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 the qualities that we might criticize about it being overly prescriptive and overly met, that it still offers that. And that offers that wow factor of getting, getting up there and finding yourself in some form of manicured meadow elevated over uh, whatever it is, 10th Avenue. Uh, now, does that broader conception of escape make it available to even more crowded neighborhoods like our own? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm not quite. I I agree. I mean, we, you know, we should cherish these opportunities, and and um, uh, we we shouldn't walk around like sad faced that places have evolved uh, into something else. You know, it doesn't mean that that we shouldn't assert our right, our stake in places like community gardens, where we still have a kind of or, organic, no pun intended, uh, action that's evolved to. To something different now in 2024 than maybe it was in, in 2004, or 84, or 74, right? Um, and what what the next thing like community gardens uh, is going to be, I don't know. Um, uh, uh, New York is is just full of spaces, and you know, uh, big big bad neoliberal capitalism and real, real estate development seems to be grabbing everything, and then you find something that that's inexplicably left behind. Uh, so, I, I don't know what you know. The, we're, we're living in a different era than than you know the the, the last three decades of the the twentieth century. Uh, I don't know what what's like uh, community gardens, but surely we we have to hold on to them very tightly and uh, push back. Um, and I think you're right that the temporally, um, you know, escape, escape takes many forms and perhaps, um, you know, the, one of the wonderful things about New York is that it's so big and so dense and so, um, there's so much activity going on. We, we can escape right in, you know, hidden in plain sight. We can hide ourselves and, you know, we can be on the subway. Isn't that a kind of an escape? Like, um, I think the, the New York City subways are like some of the most underrated public spaces in all the city. I mean, you want to talk about anonymity and, and seeing a cross section of life and, um, you know, being a being a crowded A train car, you know, at 530 p.m. going to Brooklyn and you see who's on there and what's going on. And uh, of course, it's not always fun, but but, you know, so, you know, in a, in a way, the city is ours and, and we're always free to, to move about it. And, and, and that, that's a form of escape as well, in addition to some of the things that I've shown you in a kind of more uh, temporal um, uh, strategy as you're talking about or temporal approach. Um, now, let's talk, I wanted to ask you, just because this is a point that, that jumped out of me in, in the book about how specific, to what extent the, the stuff you describe is specific to post-industrial um, structures? Uh, to what extent the experiences you describe depend on the design and materiality of, of those? And to what extent are they foreclosed by design of subsequent eras? You talk about how uh, plants that followed do not somehow offer the same qualities that the ones that you describe in your cases make available. You know, is that the case? Have we, uh, you know, are we really dealing with a, uh, a shrinking inventory of places that might provide this? Are uh, sort of high modernist structures yeah. not equipped to decay in a way that will um, lend themselves to reuse in the same way? That's a good question. I mean, there's a, certainly a fine line, like the city has real needs in terms of infrastructure. And like a lot of the places that I, I've, I've studied are, are waterfront sites. So waterfronts will crumble, they'll be dangerous. You know, they, 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 they can't stay the way they are um, forever. Um, and fixing waterfronts, it, if you really wanna fix them, you can't do it DIY, you just, you can't. You know, they, they, it's millions of dollars to, to rebuild bulkheads and rebuild piers and so on. So there's a lot at stake. And, uh, but, you know, we could add a kind of a more playful approach to go along with the kind of, um, you know, finished, polished, slick 
Wow Park uh, that you know represents the High Line or uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park, right? Like, you know, we, we've not everything should be Brooklyn Bridge Park. Not everything should be the High Line. Like, whatever that next space is, it, it should have a kind of um, evolving. There should be some space of, in it that's evolving. That's um, community determined. I don't really like to use the word determined, but but. Uh, stakeholders re, stakeholders on the ground have um a, a legitimate stake and and have um some ability to affect the form function and uses going forward um a la community gardens so maybe that's the um uh the abandoned um Mon what was called for a while the montauk cutoff in uh, Long Lion City and Matt Mass Pep. Maybe that that can be something different. Again, Brooklyn Bridge Park is fantastic, but, but I can't go there with like a shovel and a hammer and start taking things apart and building something. You know, it's, it's pretty well patrolled and sure enough, the uh, security there will, will come and stop me, perhaps even arrest me, right? So, so our, our you know, our zeal to make things, to revitalize, to recover is so great that, you know, and once we spend millions of dollars, we, we don't want people messing up our spaces. And, and that's a perfectly good, um, that's a perfectly legitimate impulse to say, no, well, look, we just spent $5 million on this complex. We put in all the drainage and we've done this and we planted it. And, you know, it, it's, it's, you've got to sign up and get on the list for the the softball or whatever we're going to do on this field. Um, but but that, somehow we, we've got to leave a piece behind, I think, you know, and that, I, I think that, that taps into, into two interesting debates. Uh, and I, I, there were some interesting comments that I want to um, raise. Except one of them is actually a, a follow um, or uh, the story I was telling about the community gardens just move forward to now, but the, your observation about uh, uh the kind of development that we do taps into two long-standing planning debates. One that has to do with the um, relative merits of incrementalism versus large-scale large planning, and the other one that has to do with our uh, failure to plan the sort of physical and functional diversity that that you and before you, uh, James Scott, and before that, Jane Jacobs, celebrate. So. Uh, we can take that one first. Uh, you know, can you can I mean we've been asking each other, we've been asking ourselves this for for decades. Uh, is there an active role for planning and preservation to play in fostering the sort of activity you document, other than just getting out of the way and letting whatever happens happens with it, which is exactly what Rick Scott of Silo City did. Is that the best we can do? Well, it, I mean, when I'm presenting it to you here, it, I, I'm giving you a kind of a simplified form. Um, I think you can argue that in places like the Central Terminal, which I really didn't talk about in, in, in great detail, um, are following that arc of formality. And, and, and now it's turning into something conventional, but um, the, the people on the kind of public and on the official public end, um, you know, there, there is a kind of playfulness to, to, the, to the master plan and, and some of the, uh, the way it's programmed. You know, we're not all going to, uh, someone like myself who's seen all these places in these different states from complete ruin to like completely fixed up and million, you know, millions of dollars in investments, you know, I'm not going to necessarily like every single thing, and 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 nor nor should I, and it's fine. But um, you know, th there's a place. There there's certainly a place for um, for planners and for architects. Uh, but but the planners and architects have to figure out a way to kind of step back from from their own rhetoric and say, all right, well, well, you know, maybe they have to be subversive. Maybe they have to say what can we leave unfinished? What, what can we, what will create a foundation for others? Maybe, maybe we don't have all the answers. Maybe 10 years from now, there'll be something even better. What, what will allow for that thing to happen? Right. That, 
that so that's a that's a great point and that's a great segue to the the next step in the story that I was telling. I was telling the story of that community group that uh, along with other community activists gave way or uh, created La Plaza Cultural. Uh, that group, Chadas, went on subsequently to squat in the abandoned building, uh, the, the, the PS64 building, uh, doing repairs and eventually turning the space into an all-purpose community and cultural center, uh, which it operated until uh, Giuliani uh, evicted them, of course. Um, and despite efforts by the building's subsequent owner to demolish the site or otherwise develop it for profitable uses, the group and other community allies, including us, uh, were able to uh, obtain landmark protection for the building. And, uh, and eventually the property was foreclosed. This happened just last year. And it is now in the hands of a community-oriented investor who is working to stabilize the structure and then return it to community use, which raises the second debate that I mentioned, which is that of the relative merits of incrementalism, uh, which, you know, like the alternative, large scale planning, everyone keeps maligning, uh, but we keep doing it. It's more expensive, it's riskier, but those who benefit from big splashy projects always find a way to rationalize it, rationalize it no matter how stupid. So I'm wondering how, how do how do we get to uh, you know in a way this this vision of uh, of increment the vision of incrementalism that you propose is is very uh, you know I was on board it's almost like a, a Zen sort of preservation practice that is less focused on achieving a fixed state than it is on the process of becoming and less process. preoccupied with long term goals than it is with the now but how do we uh, how do we convince planners or how do we convince the city to embrace uh, incrementalism? And how do we convince preservationists to uh, focus on its breadth and embrace the inevitability of constant change? Yeah, so that's, a, that's a great question. I, 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 would, I would challenge everyone to like, if you're up for it, read my book. It's, it's very readable. It's only 20 bucks now with the discount code that we, we circulated. Um, you can whip with free shipping. I just threw that out there to so, see, you know, it's not some super expensive book. And you can find it in you can find it in the strand and independent bookstore. So uh, yeah. and there, there, if you could share the discount code again, DIY25 dot F dash F I yeah. Um, you know, so I, I would love for everyone to read it and then for us to have this conversation again, because I, I don't really have those answers, right? Like I I, you know, um it's a challenge. Like, you know, before I did the accidental playground, I, I wasn't finding, I wasn't finding a lot of people who were, who were in that, this space of thinking about these, these kinds of tra transgressive appropriated uses as something that's generative of urbanism, of something that supports urban life. And in fact, people told me what I was doing wasn't legitimate and wasn't, it wasn't urban planning and it wasn't, uh, urban design. Um, and so, but, but now we're in a space where people at least can acknowledge that, that these ideas and these places, uh, people found them satisfying and, and they had a particular um, verve about them, a particular kind of form of magic that, that drew people in. So we, we, we've made some progress. Where, where this movement goes, I, I don't know. I don't know that it even is a movement at this part, at this point. But the more we engage these places where we can discover opportunities and engage them, maybe we change the course of what, what planners and um, architects do. What, I, what it's interesting, I think, in Buffalo, there's some context in, in the book about this, particularly in the, the chapter on uh, Silo City, is that Many of the people who did, who either appreciated Silo City or uh, did some people who did programming are also people whose day jobs are planners, architects, or preservationists that, that work for the city or work for a, a design firm. So, um, you know, and in the past, 
some of those people may have said, hey, well, wait, wait a second, don't talk about that. That's not, you can't talk about it in this place. This is my job. This is how I earn my living, right? So part of this is generational, I think. And uh, the, the people who come next who have known these places as places of possibility rather than just ruins that remind you that um, there used to be thousands of people employed on this site or in New York City, there used to be an office building here with hundreds of employees that were doing major transactions and now the building is vacant and we can't figure out a use for it. Um, those people, whatever that next generation is that sees these places as places of possibility, they will get excited and they will think like, it's up to me. It's up to me. It's up to me and, and other people around me to, to figure out how to engage these places. And from my spot as a city planner, as architect, maybe I can help facilitate it. But I don't, I don't know what those individual steps might be so much, or I only know, you know, in, in, in very kind of broad strokes and abstract. And each, each of these sites is so different and it, it's really hard to generalize. That is a that is a, a uncharacteristically optimistic note on which to end. We still have a few minutes. Uh, I can ask you uh, a less optimistic question, or I can invite other folks from the audience to ask uh, any questions they might have. Uh, there's another. Um, Somebody's got their hand up, so it'd be great to hear from somebody in the audience. Where? Here. Oh, um, I didn't. Wait a second. Uh, are you able to, yeah, are you able oh, can to, you turn? yeah, to, to I, well, I'm not controlling, uh, William's control, oh. Gary, uh, if, 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 uh, Theodora can put the question in the, um, Q and A, uh, function at the bottom, that would be great. Uh, the other comment that another space, actually, it also relates to the same story, the same group that we were talking about, um, uh, they have the, the Museum of Reclaimed Space. On Avenue C, which is uh, you know that that's inside a squad and it's run by members of uh, that community. It's another DIY example, and there are many. I'm I mean, familiar there's a, with it. Yeah, yeah. There's a long history. Great space. Of the Highline, the Highline itself offers a, a weird counterexample, but that is uh, you know really how that began as well. It's probably the most prominent Absolutely. of the Hudson River's industrial past, and it. Did not let it. It was uh, built in the 1930s. Uh, it, they began as partial demolition. Only 30 years later, uh, the rest of it was shut down in 1980, and then remained under threat of demolition by the like of again Giuliani, where yeah. the man where poetry goes to die. Uh, and during which time, uh, people keep kept sneaking up up there, and uh, and were drawn by this surreal experience of finding themselves in this elevated. Uh, uh, just uh, uncultivated uh, meadow in the middle of the city. Uh, and that led to the preservation movement, which was, you know, in some ways co-opted and compromised. In other ways, it is still uh, uh, a very evocative space and in some ways a victim of its own success. Undoubtedly. Uh, just listening to what you're saying, it reminds me of uh, talking about preservation stories, failures and successes. You know, Penn Station, I go through Penn Station every, every single week, twice a week, sometimes more than that. And, uh, you know, you've got, of course, this, the story of Penn Station is well known, but the, the Pennsylvania Hotel um, just was taken down, what, two years ago? Maybe even yeah. less than that. Less than that that yeah. should never have happened, especially in a strong real estate market. R ridiculous. So, uh, and it, I walk by there from Sixth Avenue and I get off the to the F and I walk by there to go to Penn Station in the morning on my way to Baltimore. Um, uh, but I walk by, it's this giant cleared site. So, you know, what it, can we convince the powers that be um, to make, you know, there, that part of Manhattan has so much infrastructure in it. It's so much stuff that, that most of us have no control over or no, no input to because it's just beyond us. Um, but we use it every day. What if we took that site and we said, you know, forget whatever people are proposing for this site. Let, let's make it something else. This, this giant building site, which was used to have the Pennsylvania Hotel, should have never been taken down. But now, now that it's, it's nothing, now it's this fenced off void, um, let's take that site back. Let's do something on that site. I don't know what it is or what's appropriate, but there's a site for... 
uh, local grassroots stakeholders, instigators, appropriators, protagonists that, that, that we can do something on. That's I'll be the marching challenge. Right behind, That's I'll the be challenge. Marching, marching right behind you, Dan. Uh, so we have run out of time. Thank you so much for, uh, well, thank you very much, Dan, for joining us. I'm hoping to continue this conversation, maybe, uh, maybe on, on the East River uh, over beer. And thanks everyone else for joining us and uh, be on the lookout for upcoming programs. I'm doing actually one on City of Yes, uh, uh, which is uh, the hearing is happening right now. And once I hang up, I'm gonna go back because it's still going on and I still haven't testified. Um, so I wish you all a good night. Thanks Juan, it's been a pleasure. Bye everyone. Thanks okay. for tuning in.